Today we're discussing this, the Sony 14mm G Master. It's like other G Master Primes, but wider and with less focus breathing. Let's get undone. Gerald undone. He's crazy. What's happening everybody? I'm Gerald Undone and I got 99 Primes, but a 50 ain't what. All right, as usual, some disclosure. Sony lent me this lens to make this review. I do not get to keep it. No money changed hands. And Sony does not get any input on this video's production or get to preview it before it's posted. I also wanna thank Sigma for lending me their 14 millimeter F1.8 for comparison, which interestingly, I believe is the only other native 14 millimeter F1.8 lens available for Sony E, but it is a massive lens. It's got that built-in MC11 neck thing. It's significantly larger than the G Master and weighs over 1200 grams with the caps on compared to the 500 grams on the Sony. So it's 2.4 times heavier, which you can definitely feel on the wrists because of the extra length. And yet the Sony has the same aperture range from f1.8 to f16, the same features, and it's even the same price at 1599 US dollars. So that makes it a bit of a no brainer, assuming that the Sony performs as well as the Sigma. And I'm happy to report that it definitely does. But before we get into the test shots, let's talk a bit more about the build and focusing. The Sony is your typical G Master lens in that it has a declickable aperture ring, a function button, AFMF switch, and a linear focusing ring. Both of these lenses will grant you accurate repeatable focus with similar throws of about 130 to 140 degrees, but the Sigma is mechanical and has a window with witness marks where the Sony is completely electronic. The Sigma's ring is stiffer, but not in a nicely dampened way, and it can actually cause some shake in your shots to get it started. The Sony's ring is a touch loose, but nicer to use overall. The Sigma is a lot louder too, and that carries over into autofocus. The Sigma actually performs quite well in most autofocus situations. It's not quite as fast as the Sony if you're quickly changing subjects, but it was quite accurate and very reliable. The only con is that it's very audible while it does it. So on-camera microphones will definitely pick it up. The Sony, on the other hand, is silent and focuses flawlessly. And the Sony lens is one of their best performing G Masters when it comes to focus breathing. Often the two biggest cons with the G Masters is that they focus breathe quite heavily and that they cost too much compared to the Sigmas. Well, in this case with the 40 millimeter, the breathing is much better controlled. It's not perfect, but acceptable and they match the Sigma's price. So that's exciting if you're shopping for a 14 millimeter lens. The Sony is also excellently weather sealed and features a better cap design, but be aware that you can't screw filters onto the front of this lens. And instead you have to use their custom rear filter cutout similar to their ultra wide zooms. The Sony also claims to have a better minimum focusing distance of 25 centimeters compared to the 27 centimeters on the Sigma. But when you actually compare the images, the Sigma appears to be focusing closer, but I think this is a byproduct of how these lenses handle distortion differently. But here, let's take a look at my test shot so I can show you what I mean. Okay, so these first two shots here are as close as you can focus on this Rubik's Cube so you can get an idea of how close you can get. And there's no lens corrections on for anything for either of these lenses. So this is the Sigma. And then if I switch over here, this is the Sony. So even though the Sony can physically focus closer, do you see how the Sigma looks like it's bigger in the frame? It almost looks like you're getting a better reproduction. But look at the surrounding around that Rubik's Cube and also look at the table and the edges of the Rubik's Cube, like if it's barreling out or pin cushioning in. And you can see that there's sort of a, a distortion that's making it sort of get closer. And it's not just perspective distortion, which I can show you in a second, but even look at the phone, the black object that's just inching into the frame or the straight line on the table. What the Sony is doing really well in these shots is minimizing distortion. Now it still has perspective distortion if you get really close with a wide angle lens, like here's a shot of a diner downtown. You can see it looks really weird and bulbous and stuff. You can still create that look. That's more of a wide angle thing, but it's about the lines being straight and not curved, you know, rectilinear versus curvilinear. So if we look at say these two images here of this chart, so this one is the Sony and then this one is the Sigma. So you can really see how it's flexing there. Here's a good example that I took of my studio, which is still pretty close where you'd think you'd get some problems. And just to give you an idea, the, the camera was on a tripod, like literally right there, like just out of the frame. It's, it's crazy how close it was and yet you can see all this depth and what you're looking at here is 35 millimeter. So that's what a 14 millimeter looks like placed right there. But look at the lines, you know, even in the corners there, they remain really straight and really nice. You don't really start to get any weirdness until the extreme corners down here when you can see that wheel is being stretched and the same thing happens, you know, down in this corner, but the bulk of the frame, you know, there's a lot of vertical things in the shot and pretty much everything is remaining really nicely straight with not much bowing at all. So that's great. Now I asked Sony how they were able to do this. And this is the marketing blurb that they gave me that this lens incorporates two extreme aspheric lens elements, one in the front and one in the rear. And the one in the front is the largest and very curved with complex design and manufacturing to make it highly accurate and sharp from center to outer edges. 
There's also an aspheric lens element in the middle, and the combination of these three elements is what makes this lens so special, as they call it. Sharp throughout, beautiful bokeh, and rectilinear, meaning little to no noticeable distortion. These elements also correct for sagittal coma flare, which is the bow tie or butterfly effect that can be seen when focusing on stars, and very few lenses render stars perfectly this round, as according to Sony. I haven't tested on Astro, but that's the explanation as to how it's able to handle distortion so well if you're interested in, you know, le how lenses are designed. Now, when it comes to that bokeh they were talking about, I have a couple of samples here that we can look at. Obviously, when we're talking ultra-wide lenses, don't expect a lot of, you know, big, awesome out-of-focus orbs. You're not really going to get that. So here I've got the Sigma and the Sony, both at 1.8. And if we punch in here, we can see that the Sony is doing better. The Sony's on the right. Because the Sigma here does have quite a bit of onion ringing in the bokeh where the, the Sony does not. And as we move out toward the edge, they both suffer from some, you know, distortion problems here, but not only does the Sony remain more round, but it's not being as stretched as much as the Sigma is. And if we swap them out for their 2.8 versions to see how they do now, the Sigma does round off a little bit better in the corner there, but still quite a bit of, you know, onion ringing throughout. And let's take a look at the center here. And still pretty much the same thing. The Sony is doing better and they're both showing equal you know, aperture blades. I think both of these are a nine bladed aperture. So similar, it's just that the bokeh on the Sigma is a bit dirtier. And while we're in here, let's take a quick look at some chromatic aberration shots I did. This one is not for chromatic aberration. I just thought it was kind of wild. I had the lens literally like right at the bench and it still could see the entire, it was, it's kind of trippy. I, I just find this lens trippy. It's a bit wide for me. Normally the widest I go is 20 mil. So messing around with the 14 mil has been kind of fun to, you know, see things from a different perspective. But anyway, let's take a look here. This one is the Sony lens. And if we punch in to where I'm focused, we're looking for, well, both chromatic aberration. Right now we're looking for longitudinal to see if there's different colors at the, you know, foreground and background elements as we focus in and out. And there's not really at all. So the longitudinal, which is the harder one to correct, is really great on the Sony. If we jump over to the Sigma, not so much. So we can see that we're getting some, you know, blue cyan in the foreground and moving into that sort of amber color in the background. And we're also seeing some stuff laterally. Now this, the Sony, although it's much better longitudinally, isn't perfect laterally. And I can show you an example of that over here. I think I have a fence shot. Yes, yeah, so here's one again to show the performance that you can expect to get from chromatic aberration, you know, up against the sky. Longitudinal is great. If we follow along the fence here, we're not seeing anything weird color fringing wise as we move throughout. But if you were to shoot I have a really exaggerated example here. It's not a great example, but if you were to just sort of shoot, you know, aimlessly with things at different focus depths up against the sky, you will notice some some lateral issues. So this, like I said, shot is completely pointless. I was doing a weird focus on it to show you these different branches. And some of the branches do have some issues. I'm going to have to punch in to be able to show you. But you will start to see some fringing on some of them, you know, lateral. But you can fix this easily if you just jump over to the develop tab and go to lens corrections, you know, we can just go manual here. And if you just put on a little bit of the D fringe, it takes it away. So that's the reason why lateral is no big deal, but it is there when you have sort of a busy shot like this, but a shot like this that you might actually, you know, have a more logical control over your focus. I didn't notice any chromatic aberration at all. So better than Sigma and nothing to really worry about in that regard. It's been a pretty terrible last few days for shooting. So I don't really have a lot of great sample images, but I took a couple just kind of, you know, mediocre shots to show you some color rendering and also some detail. So as you can see, the greens and these, you know, pink colors really pop. The lens renders colors really nicely. And if we punch way in here, you know, we've got ton, a ton of detail here to work with. This was shot on the A1, so we're looking at like 50 megapixels here. It's very sharp, plenty of detail in the center. The, the It's going to get out to the corners, not as sharp, obviously. That's just a wide angle issue. And you can see a little bit of the focus, you know, fall off here. Again, I wouldn't really consider an ultra wide to be something that you'd want to look at for really creamy you know, transitioning out of focus areas. I did one of these so you could see kind of like how the rocks do transition. You know, it's okay. It, it has a bit of a, of a harsh kind of fall off here. But again, it's to be expected when you shoot wide. You're not generally trying to do this kind of stuff. It'd be more for a, a fun perspective of a single object. You're not really trying to make, you know, creamy depth like this. You can see it's, it's okay. It's, again, the G Masters do a good job of this, but it's not amazing. But you could do something more like this Again, this is not an amazing shot, but now the focus makes a lot more sense because you're getting a more smooth kind of transition. I did a bunch of shots here of this area in my kitchen where I could focus in the center on some shots on this one, but then also redo the shot in the corner. And I did this at 
f1.8, f2, 2.8, 4, and 5, 6, and f8, I think. I went through those stops. I stopped at f8, and if a uh, tip on this lens, I found that you get a significant improvement just from going to f2. So this is at 1.8, and if I jump to f2, look for vignetting and a bit of the corners there, you can see that you get quite a bit back and forth. And then 2.8, you get a bit more. That's when it really brightens up in the corners. No corrections are on during this. And then there's not really much more to be had after that. So the sweet spot in this lens is somewhere between 2.8 and f4. And I found the same thing for sharpness. So you can see that the 2.8 is quite a bit sharper than the 1.8. But if we go more than that, it doesn't really get much better. Maybe f4 is a slight bit sharper, but... So here's the same shot again, 1.8 versus f8. If we look in the center, I'm actually focused in the corner now that the f8 is still sharper in the center, even when focused in the corner, than the 1.8. But if we look at the corner as well, that, I don't know, it's not that much better f8 in the corner when focused in the corner. So what this means, what you should take from this, is that even if you stop down all the way to f8, you're not going to sharpen up your corners that much. So I wouldn't, it's not, it's not a lens where it's like, you get to 5.6 and the corners are perfect. What's happening in the corners isn't dependent so much on aperture and more of just the way that it's wide and how it's handling distortion and that kind of thing. And I just have one more example here to show how great this lens is handling distortion and keeping things, you know, rectilinear. I've got a fence all the way in the foreground here that goes all the way along to the background. Lines are straight from edge to edge. And I focused on this house here. And this was, this was a shot that was done at f2.8. And we're getting really good detail even uh, all the way back at this house. Looks great. You can see details even in the window there. Now, when it comes to flare, both lenses definitely showed some, but differently. The Sigma suffered from a massive loss of contrast and lots of glare and ghosting, where the Sony was more controlled when it comes to the contrast, but instead it displayed these rims of larger blue orbs that I assume are reflections of the bulbous front element. Lastly, when it comes to sun stars, well, I didn't get any because the sun hasn't shown itself here in the last several days long enough for me to capture it but I think I might know someone who can help me with not only grabbing some sun stars, but also offers perspective on how this lens stacks up to the ultra wide zooms from Sony and Sigma for today's second opinion segment featuring Jared Polin. Hey Gerald, thank you for having me in your video. And yes, it is actually sunny in Philadelphia. That's funny, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. And yeah, I got some sun stars at F8 with the 14 1.8. So you asked me to give my thoughts on these zooms uh, versus the prime and which direction that I would go. Now I went out and photographed in Philadelphia. The first place that I went was the Philadelphia Museum of Art, AKA where Rocky ran up the stairs. That is a great place to test out these lenses, set up a tripod, set up the Sony A1 and just change lenses without moving anything else. So I would shoot the 12 to 24 at 14, the 14 millimeter, of course it's a prime at 14, and then the Sigma 14 to 24 2.8 at 14. I have sample raw files that you guys can download. Uh, Gerald will put the link down below, and that way you could decide for yourself which ones you think are better. Now I also ran the 14 1.8 through its paces in a photojournalistic situation, photographing an artist, as well as taking it to the Japanese garden garden in Philadelphia. Now, my feelings on it, I was surprised at how light it was. It is a light lens for 14 millimeter at 1.8. Uh, at first, I didn't think it was a lens that I was going to really like because it's a prime and I prefer having the zooms. But if you're in a situation where you wanna do astrophotography or you aren't worried about having to zoom because you could get closer or get further away, this is a fantastic option. It was sharp, it's super fast, it's super light, it's super compact, it's 1,599 bucks. You got the money, that's gonna be a fantastic option. The 14 to 24 2.8 Sigma is also a pretty small lens in comparison to the 12 to 24 2.8. And I use this in a real world situation out on the campaign trail with Bernie Sanders and it was nice and sharp. The focus was fast. I used it on the Sony A7R4 as well as the A92 and it did a great job out there. And this is a $1,299 lens. And now we've got the 12 to 24 2.8 G Master, which is a beast of a lens that carries a beast of a price at 2,900 bucks. But this is my go-to for wide angle. That 12 millimeter from 12 to 14 of the art museum stairs just gives you a little bit more. I like the versatility. Is it heavy? Yeah. Is it bigger? Yeah. Is it more expensive? Yes. But at the end of the day, if you're somebody who just goes out and shoots and you just need a wide angle on the E mount, 
the Sigma 14 to 24 is a fantastic option at $12.99. If you don't need the zoom and you can spend a little bit more money, this 1418 is very nice. Do I think there's a big difference between the 1.8 and the 2.8 to, to make up for that extra money? I mean, a couple hundred bucks? If you don't need the zoom, sure, go with, go with it. If you want that 1.8, if you shoot stars, if you want the best of the best with Honor Sir that Sony has to offer for the 14 millimeter 1.8 Prime, then go with it. I'm personally sticking with the 12 to 24. Uh, just because I like having this range. Yes, it's more expensive, but this is what I do every day. You look, you can't go wrong with either of these. I think they are all great options. If you're just out there looking for your first wide angle lens, I don't go with a Prime as my first wide angle. I go with the 14 to 24 2.8 Sigma here. Uh, if you're not an everyday, all day professional, you're gonna get great results with this and have some versatility and an extra couple hundred bucks in your pocket. So Gerald, did we get undone enough? Do I, do I take my shirt off? Is, is that how it works? I'll leave my shirt on and throw it back to you in Canada, eh? Thanks, Jared. And make sure you guys check out his video too, which likely will be uploaded at the same time as mine, so you can watch that next if you haven't seen it already. Now, normally this part in the video is where I would try and offer up some value considerations. And I think Jared did a great job of that regarding the zooms, but when it comes to the primes, there's really nothing to say. The Sony is smaller, better, faster, and the same price. The Sigma still performs quite well, so if you own it already and are happy, I probably wouldn't worry about switching to the Sony unless the size really bothers you. But if you're looking to get your first 14 millimeter prime for Sony E, the G Master is definitely the way to go. But that's gonna be it for me. I hope you found this video entertaining or at least helpful. And if you did, make sure you leave the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, try setting the playback speed to 75%. Yeah, all right, I'm done. <laughs>